Good afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are. Uh, I wanna welcome uh, everyone to today's roundtable on the future of the uh, Supreme Court. My name is Peter Trubowitz. I'm a professor in the International Relations Department uh, and the director of the Fallon United States Center uh, at the LSC, which is hosting uh, today's event. Uh, the US Supreme Court uh, opened its new term yesterday at a time when public trust and confidence in the court is, is at historic lows, uh, at least for the modern era, and the, the justices themselves um, have been publicly debating what the court's recent decisions mean for its um, legitimacy and authority as a, an institution. The court's last session ended in June with a series of um, judicial bombshells that eliminated uh, the right to um, uh, abortion, established a, a right to carry guns outside the home, uh, and limited efforts to address climate change. Uh, in the new session, the court plans to take up a series of uh, major challenges uh, on affirmative action, on voting rights, religion, free speech, and, and gay rights. And as in the case of, of last term's abortion case, Dobbs and Jackson, longstanding precedents are in play and uh, at risk uh, in this term. Um, the court's six to three conservative majority actions, especially its opinion on Dobbs, uh, thrilled conservatives while deeply antagonizing and mobilizing liberals and, and moderates in the run up to the November um, midterm elections. We've seen higher than usual voter registration, especially among women, many Senate and House contests that just a few months ago were leaning um, Republican have tightened considerably and in some cases swung toward the Democrats. Despite, I should say, lingering concerns about inflation, the economy, uh, Biden's stewardship. Um, and at a time when America's political system is racked by division and democratic backsliding, the court's willingness to overturn what many considered settled law has fueled anxieties about really the direction of future travel in the United States, uh, both internationally um, uh, as well, uh, of course, um, uh, domestically. Uh, with that in mind, we decided over the summer to assemble a panel of leading experts on the law, institution, politics to help us better understand the Supreme Court's, its recent decisions, what we might expect from the court uh, in the current term, and to place it in broader, um, some of these decisions in, in broader uh, political uh, and historical context. And in alphabetical order, they include Emily Jackson, a professor of law at um, London School of Economics at LSE here, who specializes in medical law. Theda Scotchpool, um, the Victor Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology uh, at Harvard University, uh, who's written extensively about um, the conservative movement uh, in, um, in the United States, uh, among many other things. Uh, and Jeffrey Toole is a professor of government and law uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, who writes and teaches about American politics and constitutional theory. Now, to get us started, I asked each of our panelists to take 10 minutes uh, to share some initial reflections um, on the court, where it's headed, and how they assess um, its implications. Um, Theta will get us started, uh, Emily will then follow, and Jeff will round things out before we um, open the platform um, to your questions. And we've, we've set aside uh, plenty of time for uh, audience questions, so just send your questions to us in the, in the Q&A function on, on Zoom, and I'll do my best to um, get as many of them in as possible. Um, be sure to include your name and your affiliation so I can mention that when, um, when I put the questions uh, to, um, to our panelists. So normally at this point, uh, I would ask all of you uh, to put your hands together to give our speakers one of those warm uh, LSE welcomes that we're famous for. That's not possible, of course, today. Um, so in lieu of applause, I really encourage you to pose questions uh, in the, um, in, in the Q&A period. Um, 
Athita, Emily, Jeff, welcome to the to LSE's online platform. It's great to have you with us. Athita, we're going to start with you. And I, I, one thing that caught my attention as I was doing my background research <laughs> for this uh, boning up was a recent interview um, uh, in the Atlantic where, um, where you argued that the Supreme Court is likely to play an outsized role um, that it perhaps already is, but even more so going forward in validating minority rule in the United States, which I, I found very interesting. And I wonder in your set of comments, if you could kind of place the court against the backdrop of what's going on in American politics now um, and, you know, and unpack this for us. Well, thank you, Peter. It's a delight to be here, and I'm glad it's remote because I have to walk uh, 15 minutes after this into a classroom, and that wouldn't be possible if it were I were in London. And I'm honored to be here with Emily and, and, and Jeffrey and looking forward to the questions and discussion with the audience. Um, let me just uh, lead aside the court briefly for a second and say something about American institutions in general and uh, the potentials that they create. Um, one way to think about institutions in any political system is that they create potentials that get activated in different ways in different periods. Um, uh, sometimes people think an institutional uh, analyst like myself believes that institutions have one fixed effect and that's not true at all. The reason I'm a historical institutionalist is because I understand that institutions create levers that get used in different ways in different periods. But of course, it's important to understand that the United States was always a federated system in which direct democracy was uh, minimal, um, even for white males once most of them got the right to vote in the um, 1800s. Uh, it was always a system that built in extra minority leverage for smaller states and you know, I think a lot of people point out that that was partly to protect slavery, and that's true. The compact among the states that created the American Federation did that, but it also protected Rhode Island from New York. Uh, and um, so um, that small state effect has meant that there's always a potential in the United States for um, political actors to try to maximize their clout through the Senate, which has two uh, senators per state, no matter how tiny the state may be in population or size. Um, and that's only one of the many ways in which minority leverage can be maximized. Uh, you can do it now through gerrymandering. Uh, gerrymandering is a very old uh, factor, but in state legislatures and, and even in the House of Representatives, uh, if a particular party's constituents are packed into particular geographic areas, you can uh, use current information systems to maximize the uh, advantage uh, there. All of this was a potential in the system before you even get to a Supreme Court, a federal court system that can overturn uh, legislation in the name of um, its interpretation of the majority of the justices interpretation of the constitution that that too was not there from the beginning but emerged in the 19th century. So that said, uh, let's flash forward to the current period in which um, American politics is not just polarized, but I would argue right radicalized um, uh, in, a, in a period in which um, the changing generational uh, outlooks of the population, uh, um, the increasing presence of, of black and brown people in both native born and immigrants in, in the population as a whole is caught and the changing role of religion in American life, religion has always been important um, has, has created a situation in which conservative-minded older whites in particular, living outside of metropolitan areas and college towns are um, 
to use a technical term, frightened out of their minds about the direction of uh, the country. Uh, that's certainly what you hear when you talk to people at the grassroots in these situations, as I've done in my research, both on the Tea Party and on uh, Trump supporters. Uh, and at the same time, they're being manipulated quite effectively by some very powerful actors uh, able to amass money and media power at the national uh, level. Um, many of these fearful people are fed a constant um, diet of uh, anger and um, fantastic accounts of, of threats, ethnic and racial threats on Fox News and now on media outlets even further to the right, supported by radio and internet outlets. That's their worldview in many cases, fear and anger at people who live in cities uh, and in uh, highly educated suburbs and college towns who they see as trying to turn America into something that they do not recognize. Um, in the recent period, we've seen the election of uh, the first black president of the United States, who uh, a college professor, an urbanite, um, a foreign father who helped to exacerbate those fears on the right, and then uh, an equally terrifying figure from the point of view of the center left, uh, Donald Trump, um, a um, very American character, by the way, a, a, a kind of effective uh, seller of, of nostalgia re and resentment, um, who knows how to use the current media system. So that's the backdrop against which we have to understand that there are two sets of forces seeking to, to maximize the potential for minority rule uh, in a system that creates that potential for geographically widespread and concentrated constituencies as people on the right now are. One of those sets of forces is um, expressed, but not created by Trumpism. It's uh, popular ethno-nationalism. Uh, the grassroots Tea Party organized and expressed it. Donald Trump nationalized that outlook. And it is at the point now where, because Trump is at least currently the leader of Trumpism, I don't know that he always will be, it's willing to turn to violence and threats of violence to um, suppress any potential for electoral victories on the part of the hated uh, Democrats, liberals, um, urbanites. The other force might be just called McConnellism. And that's where the courts are gonna come in. McConnellism is a series of wealthy interests, highly ideological, the Koch network was the spearhead for quite some time, that uh, are willing to dally with popular ethno-nationalism and Christian right views about uh, restoring traditional family norms in order to amass the power they need to win elections and use the Senate and the courts to hobble any possibility of majority policymaking through the presidency or through governorships. Uh, McConnellism has all, is in some ways even more ascendant right now because Mitch McConnell was able to engineer a block against Barack Obama appointing Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court. And then when Donald Trump won the 2016 election on a minority vote basis, but in the electoral college, uh, he uh, was able to stuff three people onto the court uh, who are part of a long standing federalist movement, federalist society movement that is highly ideological. And in my view is basically determined to undermine any kind of federal role in protecting equal access to the ballot. And at the same time, use court rulings to hobble and eviscerate the federal government's power to move in redistributive directions and to enforce uh, certain kinds of understandings of minority and women right, women's rights. The abortion decision, the guns decision, 
But all of this fits into it. But the big picture here, in my view, is that the courts uh, got a six to three majority, likely to be there for a long time, confident to the point of arrogance to put out that, to have that leaked draft not even modified before the final version is the height of arrogance. And they're arrogant because they know they've won the power and the leverage through McConnell's stewardship of the Senate to carry through the restorationist and restrictionist, politically restrictionist objectives that I just outlined. So I think we uh, can expect this court majority to clip Donald Trump's wings. I don't expect them to let him off the hook. I don't think they're gonna go the direction of that judge in Florida, uh, but I think they're, they're with the program of McConnellism, of locking in the inability of minority constituencies backed by the wealthiest and most free market oriented interests in the United States to uh, block majority rule through the presidency and governorships for qu quite some time to come. So that's my thought about where we are. That, that's terrific, Athena. Thank you very much for that. I mean, that uh, sets the scene um, very well. And I think you've raised a number of issues that are gonna come up in the, in the Q&A for sure. Um, um, and I would wanna tack back uh, to talk about McConnellism a bit more and popular, popular ethno-nationalism and how it's feeding into um, the court's decisions. Um, Emily, um, it's great to have you here. You have um, picked up one of these uh, court decisions, the one that really um, jolted uh, the political system uh, back in June. Dobbs, you contributed towards an amicus brief to the Supreme Court on the legal and ethical implications of that case. And I know you have some slides to share. We're gonna to try to share slides and see how that goes. Um, it looks like we're off and running. Emily, the platform is yours. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much to Peter for inviting me. I'm really delighted and honored to be here. So as Peter said, I'm going to talk about the Dobbs judgment. Um, next slide, if possible. And as Peter also said, with a group of European law professors, I contributed to an amicus brief to the court in this case. In the past, the, the US Supreme Court has sometimes drawn upon rights jurisprudence from other jurisdictions, including the European Court of Human Rights. And we were seeking to correct some misrepre misrepresentations of that jurisprudence in other amicus briefs. But obviously, it didn't make a blind bit of difference. In um, UK ref terms, for those of you who know what that is, it could be an example of anti-impact, um, absolutely zero uh, impact at all. But even if the overturning of Roe didn't come as a complete surprise, the judgments are in many ways quite shocking. Um, so next slide, please. Um, first, of course, there's the emphasis on originalism or the idea that if a right isn't expressly mentioned in the constitution, it can be recognized only if it's part of the deeply rooted traditions of the US. So the 14th Amendment on which Roe was based was ratified in uh, 1868, which was 51 years before women had the right to vote, 86 years before Brown and Board of Education, and 96 years before the Civil Rights Act. So the idea that rights are frozen in time and the court has no effective way to update them couldn't really be less progressive. The other thing that I think is really interesting about originalism um, is that initially it was framed in terms of judicial restraint, the idea that rights should be derived neutrally from the text of the constitution, but it has become incredibly value laden. I think it's in a sense, the opposite of judicial restraint. So next slide, please. Um, the Republican Party's platform of 1980 committed to the appointment of judges who respect traditional family values and the sanctity of innocent human life. So far from being an example of judicial restraint, I think Dobbs could be seen as the culmination of a more than 40 year long political project. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing that I think is really shocking about 
the judgment um, is its use of precedent. Um, it's bizarre. So it begins with the common law of England, quoting from Henry de Bracton, um, Edward Cook, um, Matthew Hale and William Blackstone. Um, and this, they were writing before the US existed. But the court, although it goes back, this is uh, straight from the judgment of the court of uh, Justice Alito, although they go back uh, way before the US existed, they don't consider themselves bound by a precedent, important precedent from the US of the last 50 years. One of the reasons why precedents matter, there are lots, lots of reasons why they do, but one of them is that they create reliance interests. Um, and the idea that women might have placed some reliance on the right to abortion and Roe versus Wade is dismissed um, in the judgment because um, abortion decision making is usually unplanned. Um, so there's a suggestion that you, you can't rely on it because you're not, plan you're not planning uh, to have an abortion. But they do mention um, the reliance interests that I think women would recognise. The idea that women since 1973 have been able to organise their intimate relationships on the assumption that if contraception fails, um, they'll have the option of abortion. That was dismissed as speculative, um, which again is quite surprising. Next slide, please. So what I want to focus on, though, in the remainder of the time I have um, is the judgment's insularity, which I think is really, really striking. Um, it's striking because we know from previous Supreme Court decisions, there's been some openness to considering how other jurisdictions protect human rights, such as this example uh, in relation to the death penalty. Um, but the Dobbs decision exists in a really, really strange vacuum, untouched by evidence or by any reference to any international uh, human rights obligations that there might be here. So next slide, please. So global reviews of abortion provision, such as um, these from The Lancet, consistently find that the abortion rate is in fact higher in countries with restrictive abortion laws than it is where the law is more liberal. I think this is a really important piece of evidence. What it means is that where abortion is available safely, it isn't just that there are fewer unsafe abortions, there are fewer abortions full stop. Um, so where abortion is illegal, that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. In fact, it happens more frequently than in countries with liberal abortion laws. The problem, of course, is it doesn't just kill fetuses, it kills women as well. So next slide, please. There's also some really shocking um, evidence that the global rate, the rate worldwide of maternal mortality is higher when there's a Republican president who enacts the global gag rule to prevent the aid budget being used for re to fund reproductive care. As soon as a democratic uh, president is elected, they will revoke the global gag rule so that aid can be used for reproductive care and the global um, maternal mortality rate goes down. Next slide, please. So the UN Commission on Human Rights is clear that denying women access to abortion is linked to discrimination, can constitute gender-based violence, torture, and inhuman and degrading treatment. Next slide, please. Access to abortion is also a central plank of the right to sexual and reproductive health. And next slide. So the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights ratified by the US in 1992 uh, requires states to allow women access to safe uh, legal abortion where their life is at risk um, or continuing the pregnancy would cause substantial pain and suffering. And there's a duty to ensure that women don't have to resort to unsafe abortion. The next slide. So the Dobbs decision is puts the US potentially in breach of multiple international obligations to protect the rights and health of women and girls. Next slide. It's also in breach of World Health Organization guidance. Um, and final slide, please. It's also failing uh, to achieve one of the sustainable millennium development goals. But what I think is so striking when one reads the judgment of the court and the concurring judgments of Justices Kavanaugh and Thomas is that you'd be forgiven for not knowing that there is this huge weight of international evidence on the gravity of restrictions on abortion for women's human rights. This isn't just being made up by campaigners. There's, there's some real concrete evidence here. Um, and to the 
really dire public health consequences of restrictive abortion provision. So to quote Sir Edward Cook from 1644, but not acknowledge the existence of human rights beyond those set down in the US Constitution, or which are deeply rooted in US history, is certainly to this outsider, frankly, breathtaking. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, yeah, and um, I must say I'm one of those who was unaware from uh, the majority opinion that they made no reference to um, uh, to effectively um, international statutes that the U.S. has uh, agreed to, and in in theory, at any rate, uh, should be abiding by. Um, I probably want to circle back on that. Um, Jeff, it's very good to uh, to have you back on the uh, LSE platform. Um, so you've you've written uh, extensively uh, about American political um, development, placing um, contemporary issues and debates in in um, in historical context. How should we think about this moment? I mean, does it um, have obvious historical parallels, and if so, what do they tell us? So thank you, Peter, for having me and everyone. Um, um, I like Tate, I'm honored to be here. Um, and Emily, um, your, your event is so timely as usual, Peter, because like this weekend, all the news was about yeah. this. Uh, all the Gallup polls and other polls, uh, lots of stories on the illegitimacy of <clears throat> the court. <clears throat> and what these stories mean by illegitimacy is what I would call, and, and is what is normally meant and should be meant by illegitimacy, is sociological legitimacy or sociological illegitimacy. That is an account of what people's reaction or the, the majority or the, the majority of the country's reaction are to the, to the authority, as you called it, of the court. And it's declined dramatically. I mean, really dramatically. Um, now, sociological legitimacy uh, is connected to what could be called normative legitimacy. That is, purportedly objective facts about the court that give rise, uh, they don't necessarily have to give rise, but tend to give rise to sociological illegitimacy. If the court is doing things badly, or if the court is behaving badly, um, a good democracy will uh, recognize that. And so actually it's a health, one healthy sign in an otherwise very unhealthy democracy in the United States is the fact that that the, that, the, that the public is actually reacting to this. Um, so I wanna say a, a few words about uh, three components of what would, could be called uh, the normative legit, illegitimacy problem that gives rise to this uh, sociological illegitimacy. First are uh, bad faith confirmations. That is uh, uh, candidates that come to their confirmations and either deceive or lie about what they think. Uh, and, and are now being recognized for that with people like Senator Susan Collins from Maine, where I'm sitting now, somehow surprised. <laughs> nobody, none of her constituents were at least uh, the Democratic uh, uh, constituents in Maine weren't surprised, but she seems to be surprised that uh, Kavanaugh, um, uh, and, uh, Kavanaugh didn't mean what he said uh, in her office or in his public hearing. Um, Second, an increasingly rhetorical judiciary. I've written about the rhetorical presidency, which was this shift from the 19th to the 20th century of presidents speaking uh, over the heads of Congress directly to the people. There's also been a dramatic shift in much more recent times in the judiciary with justices who used to be very, very strict about not talking about cases outside of their formal opinions. Uh, not talking at all earlier in our history, but when they did talk, uh, you know, talking in, about civics or talking about the court generally, but not about cases. And that's changed. Uh, most recently and famously, uh, Justice Alito took a kind of victory lap speech actually in Europe on the, uh, on the Dobbs decision that Emily just talked about, which actually is a further evidence of that incredible arrogance that uh, Theta referred to. Uh, and thirdly is partisanship, um, partisanship on the court. And partisanship is uh, not just voting uh, according to a conservative jurisprudence. Uh, the legal scholar and now president of Princeton University, 
Chris Eisgruber pointed out that the, cons the, the, the quote unquote conservative positions that justices have been taking on the Supreme Court don't necessarily go together as a jurisprudential matter. There's no reason why a position you have on the Second Amendment should predict the position you have on abortion, for example. And yet, because they do go together in lockstep with the GOP at this point in political history, they are essentially partisan. Uh, they are not jurisprudential, they're partisan. So the increasingly partisanship, partisan character of judicial uh, decision-making, those three things are loom large in why uh, the court has become illegitimate in an objective sense and is now being recognized that way by the public. Um, so most trigger the current uh, crisis that was signaled by this weekend's news to the case that Emily described so well, the Dobbs decision. And that's not unreasonable. I mean, I think people really did wake up. Um, they did wake up partly because of that leaked opinion, partly because uh, they were then more educated about the decision when it didn't change much. All, the, all, all those reasons. No question Dobbs has really had a political effect. But it also is an unusual case because uh, the uh, Alito and others were able to take advantage of the fact that the vast majority of uh, progressive legal scholars, to say nothing of liberal justices on the court, such as Ruth Bader, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, had long criticized Roe v. Wade's reasoning. So many pro progressives like Ruth Bader Ginsburg certainly agreed with the decision of Roe v. Wade, but were very critical of the opinion. Some were critical of even the decision thinking it should, be, should have been left to the states or whatnot to make that kind of uh, policy change. Um, so um, I, by the way, am not one of them. I actually think, and I've uh, recently reread re the Roe v. Wade decision, and I would urge your reader, your viewers, especially those in Europe that may not be familiar with it, to take a look at it. It's an incredibly well-reasoned decision and contrasts so starkly with Alito's Alito calls it egregiously wrong. And when you look at it, it looks like Alito's the egregious one. Uh, and uh, Blackman is very judicious and even handed and taking arguments against his own position very seriously and accommodating them in his opinion. In any event, I think Roe v. Wade was both rightly decided and also well argued. But that isn't well reasoned, but that isn't the view of the legal establishment or the judicial establishment. So that was kind of ripe. Uh, although a surprise, it was still ripe for this sort of uh, counter-revolution on the court. More surprising, and I think more consequential, and I want to spend a couple minutes on it, is the decision in 2013 to uh, overrule the uh, uh, pro provision of the 1965 Voting Rights Act in the United States, which required that uh, some states that had long histories of racial discrimination get pre-clearance for their uh, map drawing uh, and electoral, uh, uh, the, the electoral rules. They had to go through the Justice Department. This piece of legislation was one of the most important and successful in American history. And this provision of the legislation was very, very successful. And it's precisely because of that success that Chief Justice Roberts argued that the opinion that there was no longer a need for that portion of the uh, Voting Rights Act, and it was overruled, and these states no longer had to go through the Justice Department uh, uh, and be monitored for their uh, uh, electoral provisions. This already has had enormous effects in the United States in just the direction that Theta was outlining, on just the dimensions that Theta was, uh, was so uh, uh, articulately describing. Um, and is, this is really goes to the heart of dem uh, democracy. Now, what is so interesting about this, so it's a, it's a terrible, terrible decision, really, really bad with huge consequences. But what's really interesting is how contradictory it is to the core principle of conservative jurisprudence, which 
throughout American history has been a critique of liberal or progressive jurisprudence as being insufficiently deferential to legislative decision making. Um, the, the, this Voting Rights Act provision required that the legislature itself revisit it, it periodically every 10 or 15 years and reauthorize the legislation to make sure that it was working properly or see if it wasn't working at all, whether it needed to be improved. And the legislature did do that. And as late as 2006, we reauthorized this piece of legislation with 21 hearings on the House and Senate Judiciary Committee in 2006, 15,000 pages of transcripts of witnesses and hearings and discussions that led to a vote of 390 to 33 to reauthorize the legislation in the House and 98 to zero in the Senate, the very Senate that Theta so are, uh, articulately described as manifesting this federal character of the American system that gives uh, uh, considerable weight to states and small states. So the very states that were affected by the Voting Rights Act and its, and its preclearance provisions were among those that either voted to uh, uh, reauthorize or didn't vote against reauthorizing um, uh, th these provisions. That's how seriously the legislature took this. And yet the court said, we know better. This I believe is really the, uh, is, is really when history, when political historians look back on this era, if we're still, if some are still alive to do so after climate change and all that, if, if people actually are able to look back on this era, I think this is going to be the key uh, the key case that will stri uh, sh strike them as at the core of this illegitimacy crisis. I just want to close by saying a few words about what to do about it. Mm. Um, um, there are all sorts of proposals. I think the one that is most viable and most interesting is sometimes called court packing. It's to expand the number of court, uh, uh, people uh, seats on the court so as to avoid the problem that they described of, you know, of entrenching a 6-3 majority for generations. Um, you don't necessarily have to do that in a way, by the way, that hacks the court with progressives to balance conservatives. You could put moderates on the court just to get the court to act more like a court uh, in which its decisions are not so predictable uh, on partisan grounds. But in any event, uh, this has been uh, obviously criticized by many in American politics because of the of the overhang of the uh, image of the of FDR's court packing effort, which on some readings failed because he didn't actually pack the courts, but on some other readings didn't fail because even though he didn't literally pack the court, the court changed after his effort to do so. I just want to mention that the only, pre there's no president like uh, Trump, but the only president that is a little bit like him, uh, our only previous thoroughgoing demagogue to be president was Andrew Johnson. He wasn't elected like Trump. Um, and he was, he was uh, uh, pushed out of office by uh, his own party as well as the party opposite. So there, uh, there are many ways in which the Johnson case is not like uh, Trump's situation. And Trump is much worse than Andrew Johnson. But Andrew Johnson was pretty bad. Andrew Johnson was opposed to uh, all of Reconstruction except literally ending slavery. He was opposed to all the efforts to uh, improve the lives of freed slaves uh, in the Reconstruction era. Uh, in, and in, 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 in that effort, he also sought to enlist the help of the court. And uh, he nominated his attorney general to be a uh, justice, the, the Senate turned it down, but then they went a little bit farther and they joined with the house in taking away the seat that this nominee was being nominated for so that he couldn't nominate anyone else. And they provided that if another vacancy occurred, which it did in his term, 
that that seat would also be taken away and he couldn't nominate somebody for the next vacancy. Um, and then uh, 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 later when Ulysses Grant was elected president, the Congress restored those seats. This is a very, and, and this by the way, was just a, a dramatic example of what was generally in the 19th century, a much more aggressive and engaged uh, Congress with respect to shaping and managing and, and institutionally restructuring the judiciary. So there is a long historical precedent and tradition for the Congress getting involved here. And uh, if Americans are brought to understand that a little bit, I think that it would be possible to uh, reshape the court. So I'll end with that. Terrific. Thank you, Jeff. And in fact, some of the questions that are, <clears throat> excuse me, rolling in, uh, pick up on that point and we'll, so we'll want to um, uh, maybe drill down. Um, let me first just welcome uh, folks from, we have a lot of folks on the platform today, folks from the United States, but India, Colombia, China, Brazil, Italy, Greece, Australia, Germany, Poland, Bulgaria, and last but not least, Portugal. So, um, you know, it's great to have everybody here. Um, welcome. Um, there's a series of questions that have come through, and I, I think maybe I will just turn directly um, to, to a few of these to get us started. Um, one question is from David Harries. I'm not sure where David is from. Um, he asks, uh, could the far right in the United States argue that the Supreme Court has never been unbiased? that it has been dominated by liberal jurists for a long time, and that it's now their turn. Um, that we're just simply, that this is a story about a pendulum that moves from one direction or you know, from one side to the other. Um, and uh, you know, this, this point of view is actually perhaps not that far from what Roberts, said, you know, in an interview um, or in a speech, uh, Chief Justice uh, John Roberts back in uh, maybe about a month ago, um, that, um, that the Supreme Court's role should not be called into question simply because people disagree with its decisions. Many people have dismissed that argument as disingenuous for many of the reasons that you outlined, Jeff. Um, but, you know, here it is. So that's one question. Um, a second question actually goes back to um, uh, the, the point that, um, Theta, that you made about Dobbs being leaked. This is from Del Delbert Sandiford. Again, I'm not sure from where. Um, why do you think the decision was, was leaked? Was it really just because they, you know, they felt they have the power and therefore it was not only leaked, but not corrected or updated or revised. Um, was it leaked to prepare the public? What were the set of reasons behind that, the logic behind that? And then a question that goes in a very different direction, maybe a related direction from Helen Richardson, who's on the staff here at LSE. Very recently, the wife of a Supreme Court justice told the January 6th committee, that she believed the 2020 election was stolen. In such a moment unprecedented, how dangerous is this for the impartiality and future of the Supreme Court? Let me put those three questions out there and ask if any of you want to pick up on any of those. Well, I'll say a little bit and then I uh, hope to hear from the other two. You know, I don't think we know why the leak occurred. Um, it could have been uh, someone who wanted to alert the larger public to the radical change coming and give um, opponents of the decision a chance to organize and understand. Or it could have been someone who wanted to lock in the uh, first draft. And um, I'm actually someone who thinks intentions are interesting, but not that interesting. 
Uh, I'm much more interested in uh, effects. And I think it may have had both those effects, uh, the leak. It also helps to create a situation in which people are attending to the court the court's politicization. And I'm just going to say that, yes, the court goes back and forth. Um, but I think it's striking that in large periods of the court's history, uh, the, the, the political, the party orientation of the, even the ideological orientation of the president who appointed the justice was not necessarily predictive of exactly how they would vote on issues that lined up with a current party uh, program. Um, the closest analogy to the situation we have right now would be the Dred Scott decision before the, uh, before the Civil War, and that definitely contributed to the radicalization of the country and to, uh, to the, the emergence of the war and the delegitimation of the court at that time. Um, but um, I don't think this has been the normal uh, situation. I think if Merrick Garland had joined the court, even with a Trump victory in 2016, we would have uh, a little less predictability about exactly what would happen. A five to four is very different from a six to three. Uh, uh, and uh, now I'm going to just throw a question out there. Does it matter if the Supreme Court is legitimate or not? I certainly don't think it matters in public opinion, whether it is, I think it's, it depends on whether other uh, core actors in the other branches of government and in the states follow the, the rules of the, of the decisions that the court makes. And I can imagine that breaking down over time uh, because I agree with Jeff. The key decisions here are the voting rights decisions. We're about to get more of them. We could even get a decision that it further empowers state legislatures to overturn uh, majority results. Um, uh, the involvement of this court in deciding which actors in the rest of the polity will have power and the role of elections in the rest of the polity is truly unprecedented. And uh, it is, um, uh, could contribute to the breakdown of the American national system altogether. I don't really have much to add to that, and I don't know have any idea of why the the leak happened. But I, I I totally agree with what Peter just said. I think in the past um, there was some sense reading judgments of the Supreme Court that that they that judges were striving for some sort of judicial neutrality and hearing the arguments and making a decision on the basis of of the law and the facts. What's extraordinary about recent cases is, 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 as Peter and Jeff have said, how partisan it's become and, and almost sort of profoundly the opposite of judicial restraint, judicial neutrality. Um, and that's really shocking. I think that is new and I think that is different. Jeff, any? I don't, I don't have much to say except a few examples to illustrate what both Emily and Theta said. I mean, Justice Stevens was nominated by a Republican, and he came to be known as a liberal justice. Um, justice Stevens, though, uh, did take a very conservative position on the Texas flag burning case, and Justice Scalia, generally conservative, took a, what would be guard, regarded as the liberal position in that particular case. So. This is uh, more like, as they just said, more like the era surrounding Dred Scott. This uh, this sort of this sort of partisanship. I think even more partisan, actually, than during Dred Scott. I mean, Dred Scott was not just partisan. I mean, there was, you know, constitutional fissures and debates. This is real partisanship, and um, um, I think one of the reasons Merrick Garland might have made such a difference is actually because he wouldn't necessarily have uh, voted what Democrats want in every single case. I mean, he was known to be a judge's judge on the appeals court. And so he wasn't so predictable the way the Federalist uh, uh, Society judges are. I mean, I think it's fair to say that he you could predict that he wouldn't have voted to overturn Roe or something like that. But I don't think you could predict that he would be as lockstep as they are 
now he, because he was a judge. I mean, he may he, just the way he's acting as attorney general, frustrating everybody, taking his time and all that, because he has this sense of the role that goes beyond partisanship. And um, so, yeah, I think that would have made a big difference in it. it, it it's a it's a big change now. I'm going to add one thing quickly. Sure. I don't think the Federalist Society judges believe they are partisan. And it might be better if they were just partisan. Um, and I know people are going to be very puzzled at that statement. I think they are committed to a worldview that is totalizing. And uh, in other words, it's a little bit of Leninism, small l, uh, inserted in, into a place in the American political system where completely ignoring other institutional interests and majority interests and concerns, including reliance concerns, the, the ability to predict things uh, is possible. So this is a radicalizing force and it was long in the making. It was made through a series of networking opportunities and um, the way to analyze it as a social scientist, which I have not done, but somebody should, is to look at the way in which control over careers was created by the Federalist Society through the law schools and appointments to the lower levels of the judiciary. Uh, that's why you get judges now at the base level who will do just about anything to avoid issuing a decision that they think would um, hurt their chances to move up to the next rung. Um, and that's really not what anybody who created the American uh, Federal Republic ever envisaged. Um, so it's something new and it's something uh, terrifying, frankly, in its, uh, its, its authoritarian uh, possibilities. Well, let me take um, another batch of, of, of questions. One of these I think is for uh, directed to you, Jeff. Um, picks up, uh, it's from Doug Scrivener, who's um, an LSE um, alum. Uh, it's uh, how do you square the assessment that um, Roe was well-reasoned with the abandonment of reasoning, in, of that reasoning in uh, Casey uh, and Planned Parenthood? Um, you know, I, I put that out, that's the question. And, uh, you know, perhaps you'll want to take a, a bite at that apple. Another question actually brings us back to uh, a position. Uh, I think it it follows on something that you said, uh, Theda. Um, it's from Hannah um, Polipnik, who is a, a graduate student here at um, LSE. Um, and it's, do you anticipate any consequences for uh, Trump's three appointed Supreme Court judges, uh, if he's indicted and found guilty for any of the crimes for which he is under investigation. And I think your position was that the Supreme Court is not going to carry Donald Trump's water. You don't think it will be carrying Donald Trump's water if this scenario uh, plays out where there's an indictment and it ends up in, 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 in their laps. Um, and then a question uh, from Sri Lanka. Um, so we've been talking about how partisan the court is, and um, this is from a, a Kanchana in Sri Lanka. What is the importance of America, the American judiciary system for other countries, including third world countries? So if it's true that the United States has become, and the judiciary has become um, deeply partisan. Um, what are the Im international implications uh, uh, of that? This is the American judiciary is often held up as a as a model for good jurisprudence, um, I think, and um, this points in the other other direction. So I think it's somebody asking about what that means for Sri Lanka and many other countries uh, in the global south, and not only in the global south. I don't know, maybe Emily, as somebody who's outside the United States, you could you could take a bite at that apple. Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Do you want, are you gonna? Yeah, why don't we start with you? Um, so I think um, lots of countries are interested in how, what a, what a good system is for appointing judges and for getting the best judiciary 
um, you you can have to play their really important role in in terms of the separation of of powers. And I think quite a few countries, um, interestingly, have um, looked at what um, the UK has done with having an independent body to appoint judges. The UK used to have uh, a system where you've got a tap on the shoulder from the Lord Chancellor, uh, but we moved away from that some um, some years ago now. And there's an independent body. Judges have to apply, um, have to be interviewed, and it it isn't. It's explicitly non-political um we don't know judges political opinions and we um we can't tell often from their judgments and i think so i think it's the the for countries that are interested in what a mo good model is i'm not suggesting that's the only or the best model but i think for any countries thinking about how how do you get the best um the best judges um you can i think sadly the us is probably not going to be a model for that at the moment because i think it it's you can see from the, um, the Gallup poll that this is it's not being held in the high regard that really a, a, a court ought to be as the highest determination of rights in the country. Um, so I think it's I think it's it's really sad for, for the US judiciary that it, it it probably doesn't have that reputation worldwide that maybe it, it once did have. Um, but it's I, mean, I think it's 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 desperately concerning when you have a judiciary which can't doesn't do neutrality in the way that we expect judges judges to do that to leave their personal beliefs at the door so yeah. peter to to the to to your uh lse uh question about roe v wade um the the core the the, the core of roe v wade was the argument that a woman does have a right, you might say, to property in her own body that is connected to a long standing uh, jurisprudence of privacy that had already happened before Roe v. Wade. And what was striking about that case is that, unlike the current, unlike the Dobbs case, Blackman went out of his way to say, but it is also the case that there is a serious public interest common good concern with uh, regulating uh, abortions, just like regulating medical practices more generally, um, connected to the development of the fetus. Now, where Casey uh, um, and, and the other cases come in is that that line, that, that, that judgment of how do we actually do this should it be a trimester system? Should we have a conception of viability? All of that, the, the, the Roe opinion itself said was very, very difficult to do. It said it was very difficult to do. Uh, it said that in fact, there is no legal way to determine where life begins and so forth. It said, we have to make a prudential uh, judgment here and here, here's what we're going to do. And so those subsequent cases said, well, we think that you could do that better that line drawing between where public interest might be actually more weighty than a woman's uh, right to choose. Um, so all I was saying was that the basic idea that a woman had a right to choose was firmly and well argued. Uh, and the difficulties in making that judgment was also foreshadowed in that case. And the other cases are fine. I mean, they're attempting to wrestle with that. This new case doesn't do that. And this new case just upends everything. Theodore, do you want to take a re return? So the question that um, um, was posed about um, imagine that Donald Trump, the hypothetical scenario that Trump is indicted, that somehow this ends up in the Supreme Court's lap. Um, I mean, you passed over that, you, you, you took a position in on that and passed over, maybe unpack the logic a little bit. Is it because there's a potential tension between Trumpism and McConnellism? Is there some other, you know, maybe say a few words about that? Well, I'm I, I'm not an expert on 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 the doctrines that dominate the thinking of the Federalist uh, mm -hmm. clack that controls the court at this point. Um, I use that word because I don't think this is a legitimate court myself. And with that and $5, you can get 
a latte. I, I, yeah, yeah. Not here, you can't. But Doesn't yeah. matter. Uh, so I, I, I just think that their major driving force is to limit voting, uh, federal enforcement of voting access, and to fetter the ability of the federal government to regulate the economy and redistribute resources in the economy. I mean, I think that's the core thing that motivates Roberts and Kavanaugh and uh, Gorsuch, who smirks when he's, I was in the court the day that they debated uh, the key gerrymandering case that involved North Carolina, where an evenly divided state ends up with a 13 to three uh, Republican th with, with tricks like running a line through the middle of the only one of the major black colleges in the in the state so that they can't uh, ha they can't elect anybody. Uh, the smirks on Justice Gorsuch's face, and this was before the arrival of Amy, Amy Cody Barrett, told me all I needed to know. I didn't need to wait six months uh, to uh, to th 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 there was an arrogance there that was perfectly obvious. So I just think that their major goal is to um, eviscerate the federal government as a, uh, a, an equality enhancing um, redistributive um, entity. I don't think their major goal is to weaken presidential power or executive power. And the problem with what Trump wants he, he wants what that judge in North Florida did that he um, forum shopped for. He wants the ability of the federal government to be fettered uh, by the courts. And the 11th Circuit would have none of it, even though that was a two to one Trump majority. And I just don't think you're going to see them intervening on behalf of preserving Donald Trump's personal uh, safety from uh, legal uh, jeopardy. Uh, but I think they will go along with the, the McConnell plan of locking in um, minority rule uh, <laughs> through institutional manipulations and fettering the federal government's ability to act for the majority. Um, before we turn to um, some other questions, um, so we're, we're all sitting in universities and um, I think it's later this month, the end of the month, there's some important affirmative action cases that are going to be taken up by the court. I think there's there's two um, different cases, one having to do with Harvard and, and um, one uh, North Carolina. And, and um, I, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about it. I think this is a, one of the cases where people, when they're talking about settled law being unsettled and being reversed, um, they point to this case now as, you know, as a subsequent case following, following Dobbs. And I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, um, uh, you know, maybe not as significant as the voting rights case that has been discussed here, but if there's some thoughts about what we might anticipate, um, you know, with respect to those cases with this court. Jeff, thought about it? Well, I do think that affirmative action is in big trouble. Um, it, it illustrates the shift on the court. Uh, you know, we had a big case on this that involved the University of Texas a couple of years yeah. ago. Right. And uh, the, the opinion that upheld affirmative action at the appeals court level at a very conservative Fifth Circuit was written by Patrick Higginbotham, who was a, who was a conservative Republican uh, appointed by Reagan years ago, who had been talked about for the Supreme Court back when Bork was denied. Um, he was the author of the opinion upholding affirmative action. And it just shows how far the, to the right that the judiciary has moved, that he's regarded as a kind of liberal justice. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's, that that's um, in big trouble. I, I just wanted to pick up on a point that Theta made because I really do want to focus on this electoral dimension. Um, I think it spills over this McConnellism from the court into the House uh, as well. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm enormous, like many Americans, enormously appreciative of 
Lynn Cheney, and I hope she gets a lot of honorary degrees and people write nice things about her and all that. But despite all her good work on this January 6th committee, she's continued to vote against, you know, the John Lewis Act and all these things that have to do with the actual mechanics of taking care of the electoral system, which are intimately connected with the whole thing that she is so good at, which is this January 6th thing. So it just gives you a, a, a sense because not only Lynn Cheney, but of course, all these other Republicans that are reasonable in, in many ways are still locked into uh, partisanship in a way that is going to be very, very, very uh, troubling and difficult with respect to the future of electoral mechanisms in this country, which is obviously the main route that you would have to redress any of these problems. So I, I think that this spillover of McConnellism to not just the court, but to the House and, uh, and to uh, all these organizations in state legislatures and in state parties and so forth is, 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 deserves all the attention that, that uh, Theta has brought to it. Theta, can, you know, I want to just pick up on, on this, um, on McConnellism, and actually there's a question that's come in here from Lubin Rosev, uh, who is um, an LSE student uh, in, this, in the law program here. Um, and um, I mean, isn't there like, um, I mean, I think this is implicit in what you were saying, but I don't think it was fully drawn out. There's an, it, it, there's an inherent tension between if, if Trumpism and McConnellism and, or to put it in your terms, ethno-national populism, um, where the, the resentment is partly, perhaps not, I mean, not only, but partly over redistributive issues. Um, and it seems to me, um, and, and maybe you disagree with that, but, um, and that that's, that is, um, you know, that's obviously quite different than um, McConnellism. I mean, these are not people that are opposed to um, social welfare provisions and social protection and investment in infrastructure, it seems to me, at least not many of those white blue collar voters who were once democratic and crossed the lines in Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin in 2016 and again in 2020 to vote for Trump. Um, and, and so I guess the question that's being asked is, what are the potential, you know, if these two things, if there's a tension between them, what are the conflicts that can emerge? I mean, let's set aside the question of whether or not the court like indicts, you know, like the, the court takes up, uh, carries Trump's water or not, but more generally, um, you know, I, I think a kind of tension that could lead to a fragmentation of the party itself. Well, um, to I don't think that, I think there are tensions. I think there are tensions over um, existing redistributive programs that right. the white middle class and working class feels a stake in Medicare and Social Security and veterans benefits being the core of them. In the interviews we did with Tea Partiers, uh, who were the original Trumpers, um, they. Uh, felt those were things that real Americans had earned and that they wanted sustained. They saw Obama and Obamacare and anything more the government could do like student loan relief or uh, food stamps for the poor, uh, any of those things they saw as threats even to the programs that they valued. And you notice that Trump in his 2016 election carefully fudged what he had in mind for the core of the existing American elderly oriented welfare state. Mm -hmm. But um, so there's tension about that because McConnellism is about the Koch network. It's about uh, protecting wealthy people from having to pay taxes or deal with government regulations. And uh, so uh, McConnell's constituents would like to limit and roll back. Um, 
Social Security and Medicare, as well as Obamacare and anything else the government might do for them, for, for working and middle class people. Uh, but I think things have evolved. Uh, we now have a tension over authoritarian, different versions of authoritarianism and, and locking in minority authoritarian rule. Do you do it by manipulating the existing levers to the hilt? That's McConnellism. Uh, the Electoral College, the uh, uh, Senate levers, the manipulation of the voting access, that they, they're all behind that, even Romney and, and Cheney. Or do you do it by threatening violence and actually rolling back the results of elections? That's Trumpism. And the other big division is over ethnic variety in America. I think that McConnellism actually doesn't care what color the skin is of the people who are disadvantaged. Uh, but I think uh, the Trumpists do, and particularly the passionate grassroots supporters of Trump who are now all blue collar men, by the way. There's lots of middle-class people. There are lots of highly educated people. There are some utterly shameful graduates of Harvard University who are, are, are going this route, including the appeals to the rawest forms of racism and ethnic resentment. Uh, so that is um, the other division. Now, is this gonna tear the Republican party apart? No, it is not going to, not until they lose elections. If they can, uh, as, as, as uh, odd bedfellows work together and win elections as they are poised to do, they think, in 2022 and 2024, they will not turn on each other in a way that will disrupt the unholy alliance that is the Republican Party at this time. They have to lose. And they have to lose to forces that have to uh, follow the Bill Belichick principle of finding out that the referees are biased and winning anyway. That's the, the challenge Democrats face is that they must turn out people who doubt that their votes matter in terms of governing outcomes. And they must build coalitions across very disparate factions in the Democratic Party and people who live in very different parts of the United States, and they must win elections in the face of manipulations of the rules of voting access. That's hard. The hour is late. The time is now. For folks outside the United States, that Bill Belichick reference is to American football. <laughs> yeah, that's the, 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 the New England Patriots co coach uh, who doesn't whine about the referees. He finds out what they're going to do and trains his team to win anyway. Uh, at least he did when he had Tom Brady. Uh, it helps to have a Tom Brady. All right. Um, so another set, uh, one question that has come in from um, Laura McNeil, um, who's an LSE a student, um, is judicial supremacy, I guess the doctrine of judicial supremacy, um, uh, well, it just disappeared um, from my screen, which is really strange. Um, but I think the question was, is that, yes, is that a factor to consider uh, in the overall thinking of, of the Supreme Court's decisions? Um, so Jeff, I mean, maybe that's a, a question for, um, for you. And then a, a question, I think Theta, maybe Theta, you maybe have answered this, but um, effectively uh, with your last uh, comment, but how likely are the Democrats to increase the number sitting on the Supreme Court? Um, and um, uh, perhaps if, if Puerto Rico becomes a state, I, I don't know, um, you know, maybe you want to say, a few words um, um, about that. Um, and um, well, let me just put those two questions out there. Maybe start with you, Jeff, on, uh, on judicial so, supremacy. So one thing that we conflate uh, in courses too much and certainly in our political culture is the, the arguments for judicial okay. review right. and the claims of judicial finality or judicial supremacy. So the arguments for judicial review 
which go way back to even the arguments over the ratification of the Constitution, is simply that in order for the <clears throat> court to do its job in resolving cases and controversies, it sometimes needs to interpret the meaning of the Constitution. And when that conflicts with the meaning of the statute, it's a higher law and it, so it, it, it prevails, just like one statute might prevail over some other statute. So it, it follows ineluctably from the job of being a judge that you would have judicial review and that that decision would obviously be binding on the parties to those lawsuits. The further claim, however, that it would render policy for the whole country on the matter that the case was about, that's the notion of judicial su supremacy or judicial finality. And that's been contested all throughout American political history. I mean, in the Dred Scott case that, for example, we were, we, we, we referenced earlier, mm -hmm. Lincoln's reaction to that was to, our, to, to explain this point that I'm making to the American people and to say, look, it was wrong. I, if I had been a judge, I would have decided differently. But they are the judiciary and poor Dred Scott is going to be sent back as a fugitive slave to a slave master because part of my job is to carry out the, the judgments of the judiciary. But I don't have to do any more than that. It isn't the policy of the United States. If they want to send other fugitives back, they're going to have to bring the cases one by one because there is no judicial finality here. It's just it, it, beyond the beyond the dispute. So, um, but Americans have come to uh, to think, and 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 jurists have come to argue that somehow what the Supreme Court says is the final word on what the Constitution means generally. Uh, and for the conduct of public policy in the United States. And that just isn't true as a matter of theory. And as a matter of practice, it would take, you know, a new public education to, uh, to awaken people to the fact that Congress and the president and even ordinary citizens have a role in constitutional interpretation, not just the court. Mm -hmm. So remind me uh, what you asked me. Uh, <laughs> so there was a question about, um, in a way you've kind of already answered it, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit, maybe it doesn't require that much elaboration, is what are the chances, where is the question? Oh, yeah. What are the chances that the Democrats will be able to increase the number, um, you know, of justices on the Supreme Court? You know, I think it's very low. And the reason I think there are two reasons I think it's very low. One is I think it's going to be hard for Democrats to get enough of a consistent majority um, controlling the presidency in both houses of Congress um, to contemplate that kind of uh, institutional rebalancing move. Um, but even if let's say that they hold the house this fall and gain two senators. And I don't think that's impossible. I think they're not mm -hmm. on track to do that right now at all. That's not the way I see it, right. but um, they could be. And I think they should be emphasizing abortion as a freedom issue much more than they are. And I agree with uh, the argument of Josh Marshall at Talking Points Memo that uh, the senators should have have been clear that if two more of them are elected and the House is held, they will reinstate Roe, which I think most Americans understand as a freedom issue. Mm -hmm. and, and that is, you always wanna be with a freedom issue in America, you really do. So I think that potential exists. And you know, the first thing that they're likely to do is to move on things like uh, federal voting rights. And I think that's what they should do. I don't think they should move on adding states to the union or adding uh, people on the court. And although I'm not, you know, I don't have the expertise of the other two on the panel, I, I just would, court packing doesn't strike me as a good idea because it sets up a tit for tat in a, in a very evenly balanced system that could swing back and forth. What about why, not instead, why not instead, why not instead rule out certain areas uh, that the court can't can't, uh, for example, voting rights, just say 
hey, they can't change that, or they can't change it without Congress having a chance to come back and vote against, uh, to overturn that. I would see mechanisms of, of, of restricting their, their arrogance and their jurisdiction to be better uh, positioned uh, to chip away at uh, what otherwise could be a judicial autocracy for a very long time. What about term limits as a possibility too? Term limits, and also I like the idea of unpredictable rotation of um, of other. Um, I think creating more unpredictability. Uh, what, right what now, do you mean by unpredictable, uh, I can tell you right now what they're going to decide about all the cases this term, uh -huh. and that's bad. Um, so unpredictability would be reintroduced. If you, if you circulated some of the uh, district judges on in a random way. So all these things, Peter, uh, are good. And uh, I think one of the lessons I think from the FDR episode is that you don't actually have to win a dispute for it to have an effect. So uh, court packing ha doesn't have to materialize. Uh, Tenure changes don't have to happen. I like the idea of restricting the, um, you know, the the ambit of the of the court's jurisdiction. All those things uh, robustly discussed and seriously debated and considered in Congress are themselves going to have an effect on the court. So uh, I, I'm for I'm for that I'm for that robust. I mean, I would like some of them to happen too, but I'm for that robust discussion. But, but do, wouldn't we, to be able to get to that point where you can have a reasoned discussion about whether it's restricting the ambit of the issues or term limits or, you know, um, or introducing some kind of, um, you know, uncertainty into the case selection, um, you need to dial down the level of the temperature has to come down. First, it would seem, uh, you know, uh, the partisan temperature as a, as a kind of um, antecedent uh, to that, which actually it, it brings me to, we've got about six minutes here, and I think I would like to end with a question that came in early um, from, um, um, from Michael Harvey uh, at um, Open University. Um, uh, how feasible is um, a reduction in the extent of partisan politics within the United States, uh, in the United States within the next 10 years? And what is most likely to bring this about? And let me just underscore that this is a huge issue on this side of the pond. And the reason it is, or one important reason it is, is there are many people who think that Joe Biden is just a brief respite and that the US is gonna flip back. If it's not Trump, that it'll be somebody out of that, a Trump wannabe of some type. And, um, and the concern here is less about what's happening, kind of its consequences or implications inside the United States. It's not that people don't care about that. Is that they, they care about what it means for America's international commitments in the Ukraine, you know, and, and many, many different things with commitments to international institutions, NATO, and so forth. And so it does it, it there's a kind of a, a, like a deep interest in this question. It's an important question. And okay, so I've just used up one of those. <laughs> so um, I, I wonder if, if you could all maybe like reflect on this. Um, you know, um, um, uh, Jeff, maybe start with you and then we'll go to Emily and then and, and Theta, maybe we'll round it out. So you, you get about like a minute and 15 seconds each, minute and a half. So my interpretation of your question is that this issue of the Supreme Court legitimacy that we've chosen to talk about today is, is nested in the larger crisis of democracy in the United States and even in the world, but particularly in the United States as far as the things I know about. And I actually do think, you know, that we've had in the past things called critical elections that are more important than ordinary elections. This is more than a critical election. I mean, uh, nations historically have, like people, 
grown and matured and then decayed and died, and sometimes quickly, like people do, and sometimes slowly, like people do. Uh, and that's that's the case now. It's often difficult to see when you're in the middle of it because you need a much wider lens, a longer perspective to see how nations work. Um, and so to the extent that we can understand something that we're actually living through, my best guess is that uh, this is very, very, very serious, likely deadly cancer, but one that could in, that, that could be... Uh, you know, put into some sort of remission, but that people have to wake up to that. And it's the waking up to that that's the only possibility to, to get people to the polls in the way that uh, Theta called for earlier across coalitions, uh, voting in situations that are stacked, uh, 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 you know, in terms of the mechanics of it and all that. The only way to have that kind of peaceful revolutionary spirit is for people to wake up that this is really serious business now. This is a bad time for the United States. Emily, how do things look to you on this side of the pond? And so, so I mean, I think um, obviously, if the Dobbs decision galvanizes people to vote and galvanizes people to register to vote, then that's got to be a really, really good thing. I completely agree. With, with what's been said and what Theda said about the importance of voting and voting um, voting these people out. On, on this side, we've, we've had our own um, little um, experiment with right-wing populism. Um, and one feels, I mean, one doesn't know, I, something dramatic may have happened while I've been at work today. Who knows, the, the times <laughs> change so quickly at the moment. Um, but it does feel as though that might be coming to an end. And it's really hard to see, isn't it, what the tipping point is for, um, for that but but certainly i think um i'm optimistic by the number of women in the states who just see the the taking away of the right to abortion as being just appalling for them and their their daughters and their nieces and their family and their friends and if that gets the vote out then that um, that's that's a good thing but it's 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 critical totally agree with what what jeffrey just said this is an absolutely critical election for america Theta, so I promised you a hard stop so that you could go <laughs> teach. So you've got one minute. <laughs> you're, you're muted. This is absolutely a critical juncture, both for the United States and for the world, um, because the US role is, as you said, if the United States dies of this Trumpist cancer, um, the ability uh, to create alliances to sustain democracy and to rein in terrible autocrats, murderous autocrats, will be uh, weakened considerably. I think there's no way to do it, though, by saying lower the temperature. The temperature has to be high on the side of those who want to defend American democracy and representative institutions. And it has to be higher than it is now and higher than even abortion will make it. There has to be an understanding that this is a critical juncture. People have to turn out, they have to vote for Democrats, even if they have to hold their noses, they have to vote against these authoritarian dallying Republicans. And then after that's accomplished, then we can lower the temperature and moderate and create mutual respect. That's Very what good. I hope for. That's what I fear may not happen. Folks, ladies and gentlemen on the platform, great pleasure to have the opportunity to listen to um, what a great group of uh, panelists, distinguished panelists. Thanks for joining us, Emily, Theta, Jeff. Many thanks for taking time to share your thoughts about the future of the court. I think our viewers found them as insightful and helpful as I did to everyone. From all of us at the uh, Phelan U.S. Center at LSE, stay healthy and stay safe.